G'day ladies and gentlemen, my name is Troy McCubbin and I'll be your tour guide this evening, this morning, this afternoon for Guitar Wank Podcast. I'm here with the amazing, the incredible, the voluptuous Bruce Foreman. <laughs> They're like the best words. Beautiful. He's put on some weight. And Scott Henderson, looking lovely in an evening gown dress tonight. He's got dressed up, which is great. Uh, if you haven't checked out any of our podcasts before, please go to guitarwank.com. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook, all your social media outlets. Here we have Bruce Foreman and Scott Henderson. Welcome, gentlemen. pisses me off. Do we have ones? Yeah, I got one. Oh, drummers, that's right. Drummers. Yeah, in general? <laughs> no, not at all in general. But but certain guys, they just don't get it. Like, I don't know what happened to their brains, but <laughs> it's like they never listen to real drummers. And drums has unfortunately gone to the top of the list, dare I say it, even more than guitar. You know, you hear these guitar players, you know, trying to copy Eddie Van Halen, but with absolutely none of the soul. All they want to do is just be able to tap faster than the next guy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yep. And they put the metronome on and see how fast they can play this shred lick. <laughs> it doesn't have an ounce of heart and soul in it. It's just purely technique and bullshit. Drummers have surpassed that <laughs> in idiocy. I just can't believe it, man. Some of these guys, they just want to be the fastest drummer in the world. And they actually practice on how to shift the beat over an eighth note or or a sixteenth note and pick it up in eight bars. In talking, other words, stump the band. Are you talking Virgil? <laughs> of course I'm talking Virgil. Yeah, he's one of the main offenders. Yeah, Virgil, Ron Bruner Jr. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, these guys, yeah. you know. God. Well, it is yeah. a different. It's just, it's different. Well, it's, in the words of Chet Baker, it takes a really good drummer to be better than no drummer at all. <laughs> uh, I I had the the, yeah, I had the miss opportunity of working with Virgil. In fact, he played in Australia with Tribal Tech, and it was a disaster, you know, because Willis was almost going to just crack his bass over the guy's head. But this is a long time ago. I've heard from different sources that Virgil doesn't play like that anymore. Right. That he's very respectful of other musicians now. Because the first job of a drummer is to make a good groove and to make the music sound good. Anybody knows that. But there are a lot of drummers that just don't have that on their radar. Mm. They just miss that point. And I've done a couple gigs with Ronald Bruner Jr., and he's one of those drummers that's hired and fired a week later by just about everybody you can name because of his inability to, to support the other musicians. I've heard he's better now. You know, I've heard he's you know kind of calmed down and mm -hmm. he's keeping gigs for longer. But drummers that just don't get it, that, and there's a lot of them, believe me, there's a lot of them. They're coming up with chops rather than ability to groove and ability to make the music pop and sound good like you want to listen to it and m most importantly to support the other musicians in the band and make them sound good they just don't they they don't have that as a priority yeah, yeah. all they have as their priority is their chops and they use them at every opportunity they can <laughs> get which is basically all the time <laughs> And when you listen to the best drummers, the ones that are the most revered, Tony Williams, Elvin Jones, John Bonham, mm -hmm. these are the high, you know, the highest regarded drummers. They don't do that. Yeah. They groove, you know, and they have some amazing chops and they find the place to use them, but never at the expense of making the band sound bad or making the musicians wonder where one is. Right? It's always perfect example, Gary Novak. I watch his hands, and they're so moving so fast at the speed of light. Or Marvin Smitty Smith. I watch his hands, and they're moving so fast at the speed of light, I don't even know what's going on. Yet I feel one, I feel the groove just as much as if it was Charlie Watts. Yeah. 
because they know how to take all that amazing energy and put it into the groove. You never, they never obscure it. And those are great drummers. And Dennis Chambers, another guy who who can go off the the you know go off the groove and even play rubato, but he does it on his drum solos. Yeah. That's different. Yep. He doesn't do it when you're trying to play a solo. <laughs> yeah, that's what makes things up. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I I gotta say. I play the drums. <clears throat> the drums are one of my favorite instruments. It's got to be stated that if there's a drummer, if the band is happening, that's because the drummer's happening. If the band is not happening, it's because the drummer's not happening. That's how much power mm. the drummer has over the overall thing. And so, you know, when I joked about Chet Baker, it's really true. If your band is happening, if you've got a drummer, you got to have a happening drummer. Otherwise, you're shit out of luck. That's the way it is. A lot of my love of jazz came from the drummers, from listening so much to Art Blakey and Max Roach, Elvin Jones, Philly Joe Jones, Billy Higgins. Those were the guys I really listened to a lot as a kid. I mean, not just on records, live. I heard them live a lot. Wow. And, uh, and got, had the good fortune to play with all of them. At, you know, Max just once, but, you know. And... I study them because to me they're they're the architects of the energy and the dynamics of a band. The the band goes and I can't agree with Scott more that drumming just like guitar playing has become this sort of analytical study where guys can literally listen to a drummer and get all their tricks down and then turn that into something so unmusical that it's unbelievable. Something that was so musical and so amazing and so in context with what... Did I mention Art Blakey before? Because I should have mentioned him first. Anyways, um, you know, those guys played that stuff and it was so in context and so beautiful. And, and it's taken by guys and they just play it all the time. And worse yet, you look over and you can tell because there's, there's a thing when you're playing along and everything's going fine. It sounds like music. I mean, the drummer can be playing a lot. He can be playing a little. It just feels and sounds like music. You're playing. And then all of a sudden, it starts to sound like noise. Yeah. It's just like a boom. And I'll guarantee you every time, because I've done it numerous times, I'll look over and the drummer is like looking down and he's, you know, he's, he's reliving some thing that he's been practicing or something on a record somewhere he heard. And he's completely left the band. And then all of a sudden, it's noisy. And it could be even playing less than he had been playing before he did that. But because before he did that, he was in the band, so he was blending with what's happening, and he was feeding off of ideas. And he, you know what I'm saying? So there was this musicality to it. It never, like, Smitty never sounds noisy to me. He's always playing you're with you, and you're, and you're feeding off each other. And so it never gets noisy. And I hear guys who play one-tenth what he plays, and they sound noisy. It's because they're off in their own mm -hmm. practice room but they're on the gig with me. They're not playing to the and, and, and that's you know. but, that, but that can be really true of guitar players. We're the, oh, yeah. we're the second worst offenders of that, and maybe even bigger offenders, but the thing is, is when we do it, we don't have as much of a negative effect on the music. Right, we don't have the power to <laughs> screw right. it up as much. So as there's do. that. And, and I always suggest to my students, if they're going to play jazz, is to study these drummers, the, particularly the five or six that I mentioned, and learn what... Rhythmic effects set them off. Like with Elvin, there are certain rhythmic sequences that make him go into his thing. They obviously were fed to him by Coltrane. And if you can hear a drummer and kind of know who their heroes are, and then you can access some of that vocabulary that gets the responses you want, it's like being a guy who wants to blow up a building, right? You're that guy. You got to know where the fuse to the dynamite is, and you got to know where to put it to blow the building up right. And in many ways, to me, if you're going to play with a drummer, you got to know how to set the drummer off. You got to know how to set the drummer up, and you got to know how to get their attention and have their energy working with yours to create your state. It's not just you taking a solo. You're now in a band, and you need to be a leader of that band when you take your solo, and you need to be aware of the effects of what you do and where their tendencies are, 
and how to make it work for the best music in the moment. That's what jazz is about. That's the smart part of playing music. I don't think the smart part is knowing like this cool scale to play over this chord. The smart part is being strategically aware of what's happening around you and how to make your playing and the people playing around you to get the most productivity and imagination out of it. And, and that's, that's a whole thing of experience, true, but you can learn this by studying and watching at live performance particularly, but also listening to records. And do you know how many drummers it takes to change a light bulb? <laughs> no, and they have a machine to do that. That's now. exactly. <laughs> yeah, uh, but, you, you know, I, I want to add, you know, I was talking about mainly busy drummers before, but it really doesn't have anything to do with being busy or not busy. Yeah. Busy is not the problem. Knowing how to be busy in context. It's all about context. It's all about what, what you do fits what's going on in the music or not. Because I've had a lot of guys... I play with a lot of guys that they don't play busy, but they still somehow manage to stump the band like a game. It's almost like a game. Mm. Oh yeah, like, let's see how we can part. throw the band off by superimposing another beat, which has nothing to do, which may be a cousin of the beat that the song is in. But let's play another beat within that concept of of the music. I can think of no stupider skill to learn than that. Yeah. If you're I, not quali- yeah. If you, sometimes yeah. it works. I've heard Vinny make it work a couple times. Yeah. Where he'll go into like a cousin of a beat for just a second, and you go, yeah, that was hip. But when you start doing it for long periods of time, and you're playing in one groove and the other guys, it works for prog rock. Yeah. But it does not. It's not a jazzy thing. It's not what. It's not what I would consider helping your improvise well, improvise better. You're showing your age, my friend, because really the and and I, while I aesthetically agree with you, mm-hmm. you, you are aware that pretty much the whole point of jazz in many cases now is to stump not only the band but the audience. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, well, no, I, no. I mean, it like, may be this, that this it, infatuation with now, yeah. okay. These guys have this infatuation with odd meters. Great. I mean, I love odd meter playing. I, I love listening to it back to its true roots, which is Slavic music and mm-hmm. and stuff like that, where it's really part of the and Indian <laughs> music. Where it's, mm-hmm. I love it. Don't get me wrong. I don't have a problem with it. I've tried to play it for a long time myself these guys play it and the whole point of it is to get it down so you can like hide it so you can play all this other stuff over it so no one can even hear what that groove is and you can you know what i'm saying so you're so smart that you can play all these permutations over it and still keep you keep your place somewhere inside of yourself but the guy listening like it's his job to sit there and keep the place of the music and hear the band kind of going crazy against it and we come out now we're now a million I mean, dollars that the guitarist or the keyboard player or the sax player who's playing against that is not doing that he's just trying to play a solo oh no sometimes they are no i mean i know guys that can really do it they're ninjas yeah. they're they're fucking ninjas. okay well i'm, I'm not and, so. and, and no I, I know guys no they can do it but my point is is like <clears throat> You realize where where we're going here. We 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 took like a cool thing like seven, which is definitely different than four or or five or nine or eleven or whatever, and then it's not like whipping post by the Allman Brothers, where they played eleven and the whole point was to sit there and pound that eleven and make this hypnotic thing, and then they could play over it. These guys are playing that and then hiding it the whole time from each other and from us. It's like, what's the point of? I, I, I'm I'm still I'm missing other than. The, the, the mental chess game that's going on, I'm missing... I mean, I guess maybe I don't have the ability to sit back and really listen as a listener. I'm, t- I'm too... I, I play too well. I, I know too much what I'm hearing. So for me, I'm, I can hear that everybody's hiding shit and I'm trying to keep my place in the middle of this, this, this amazing mental chess game that's going on. And I'm appreciating the mastery... 
but I've got like a headache now and, <laughs> and, and I don't have the ability to just sit there and kind of maybe if I did the right kind of drugs or drank something, I could sit back and just let it wash over me and maybe I'd feel some sort of textural thing that makes it cool, but I can't go there. I just can't. I mean, I'm incapable. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm too educated. Well, to but to aren't that. you off the subject just a little bit about what, like, say, when we started with what pisses you off? Yes, but this... You're, you're okay. talking about the whole band now as a regard, um, instead of, like, one guy who's throwing the band off and making their lives right, miserable. Right, right, but I'm just... I'm, point, I'm <laughs> pointing... It's not like it. Sting and Vinny doing I thought song, it was. Right? I thought it just kind of fit into no. it in the way... You no. know, you were talking about guys that move the beat around for the hell of it. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about guys that that will purposely play something hard and then obscure it to, so it's even yeah. harder and play a mental game on trying to lose the band, and try, which is which was your point. Right. And see, I'm not as, as far gone as you think I am. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't mean I'm not far gone. There's not as far no, gone as you think I am. pretty far gone. Everybody knows that. <laughs> but Let's you, not try to hide that. No, I'm not, even in, I'm not even denying it. But in this case, you know, I had a point. And you, you, you went to sleep on yourself. <laughs> Uh, thank you for spending some time with us here with Guitar Wank Podcasts. We're having a great time and you've probably missed out on even better times with the other podcasts that you miss. So you need to go to guitarwank.com, click around, find out all the information that you've missed, leave a comment, buy a t-shirt, damn, buy two, buy underwear. We don't care. Just send us money. I'm here with Bruce Foreman, Scott Henderson, and I'm Troy McCubbin. This is Guitar Wank Podcasts. My, my point, getting back to the drummer, <laughs> is that when the drummer is influenced to play something that is out, let's take, let's take actual proof by Herbie Hancock as an example. Take Herbie, Herbie Hancock's actual proof. Now, Herbie was playing about as rhythmic and it had a million rhythmic vocabulary you know, ideas in that tune, and Mike Clark took advantage of that and played against them or played with them and stuff. And there's a lot of times I listen to that tune and I, I go, oh man, I lost one. Because they're taking it so far out rhythmically and they're doing such hip stuff. But there's a reason for it. Because the instigator is the guy who's playing the solo. Mm -hmm. Herbie is the, he's the boss. He's taking it and, and, and Mike is responding to him in incredibly musical ways even though they're really sophisticated rhythmically and sometimes you lose your place in the music because it gets so far out sometimes. And at least I do. But of course, my rhythmic uh, sophistication ended with cool in the gang. So, <laughs> so I lose my place. On, you're on you're saying that. when the drummer does it and a non... Just to throw the Without band or just show any off, hey, look what I know. Here's, here's how you can tell. Drummer's playing great. I'm not going to mention names. Drummer's heard. playing really, really great, grooving like crazy, playing some great chop stuff, throwing in some energy, but it still sounds musical. Then another drummer walks into the room. All of a sudden, boom, different guy. He's playing chops. He's chopping out through... I'm playing eighth notes. And he's going... <laughs> Definitely not inspired by the eighth notes I'm playing, <laughs> but inspired by the drummer who just walked into the room. Right. That's what I'm fucking talking about. Right. Those guys need to be hung. <laughs> I, you know, I think context is key. If you know, you, you you really tell. For me, it's just a simple thing. It sounds like music when they're playing, and it sounds like noise when they're practicing. So yeah, it's. St I think Sting does it the best because on a commercial side of things, because he makes all that odd meter stuff pop. It's not about odd meter as much as is is just how the drummer reacts or doesn't react to right. his fellow musicians. And when you, when he doesn't react, could be that he's asleep and misses great things to play. That yeah. he's thinking about something else, and you're playing something that really should be picked up on if you want to create a band solo instead of just one guitar player, one saxophone player taking a solo. Could have been a great band solo if the drummer had helped. Instead, he just played right through it like it didn't exist. 
That's not the way to do it either. But, and that's one scenario. Then the other scenario is when the soloist is playing some really melodic stuff and all of a sudden the drummer decides to shift it over an eighth note <laughs> for no reason. Just decides to do something corny and stupid just like he was practicing. Like, hmm, I'm bored now. So I think what I'll do is just shift the beat over a minute or go into a cousin groove and I don't really care what the solos is playing right now. I'm just going to do this because I'm bored. And I want to show other people that I know how to do it. So I'm going to do it. Right now at this particular time, and it has nothing to do with what's going on in the music. And there is a, um, a lesson here to be learned, even if we can turn the lens back on... Because we've, we've sufficiently defecated all over the heads of drummers now. Um, Not enough. <laughs> Sufficiently. <laughs> Just barely sufficient. <laughs> okay, barely sufficiently. And we need to look at ourselves as guitar players and see how much of that we bring. How many times we either in a solo or comping situation, accompaniment situation, <clears throat> that we just play shit because we can, because we're bored, because a girl or another guitar player walks in, or, or worse yet, a girl guitar player walks in. <laughs> you know, it does happen. And we are human. And, and while I would readily admit that anything we do cannot have the detrimental effect that a drummer can have on the overall, it, it's still something we always have to keep in check within ourselves. Even to the point of, we practice a lot. I mean, if you're like me, I, I like to play a lot. I practice a lot. So the danger for me is walking into a gig and just to continue doing what I was doing at home, mm -hmm. you know, and not being 100% invested in what's happening in the moment with the other people I'm playing with and who the people I'm playing for. You know, if we can just take the lesson learned from this and turn the mirror around and make sure that we attain higher musical heights because of our awareness of this. That makes it a productive rant rather than a just a fun to pee all over the ground or something. I like peeing on the ground. But whatever. <laughs> hey, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Because there are definitely bad nights that we all have where we know we're not really playing music but we're practicing. We all, we all have those nights. It's like you just can't connect. With me, it's more of a sound issue. Like when, when the drums and bass become obscured in some way, like when, I only, when all I can hear is the bass frequencies, but I can't hear the actual bass guitar, but I hear the low frequencies that it produces, but I can't distinguish the notes. Very hard to connect with uh, some of these big rooms, these big boomy rooms where the drums sort of wash out and the rhythm section becomes this washy thing that you have to play over, and there's not that crisp sound that, that enables you to connect with them. That's where I have the hardest time, and then that makes me focus in on myself, because I can't focus in on them as much, so it makes me look at my hands and look at just, I don't know, just, it, it seems like I'm just trying to practice. Yeah. Because I don't have a choice. A million times I've told my students who, who are really involved in the millisecond aspect of playing guitar, like, was that the right note over this chord? Was that the right note over this chord? And they're only, it's like they've got blinders to the left and the right. They're not seeing the big picture. They only see what's happening in that little millisecond of each, each moment. But, uh, uh, because there's no connection. Say no, penis instead. Yeah, okay. <laughs> There's no, conne there's no connection with a drum machine, which often I'm playing with students at school with a drum machine. So since you can't really connect with a drum machine because it doesn't respond to anything you play, it's easy, it's easy to fall into that mode of only playing for yourself alone. And that, that is a big danger for any improviser to get into that situation. Not only because it doesn't create good music, but because it makes you very critical of yourself because you have, you're not really playing music, you're just playing for yourself and therefore the more you play for yourself, the more you judge yourself at the moment and say, well, that wasn't very good or that wasn't very good or what I just played wasn't very good because you're not really playing music, you're just judging yourself and 
it's not fun. It's just stress. That's a horrible place to be. Yeah, it, yeah, and everybody has those bad nights where where they get to that, where they find themselves in that place. Like I say, for me, a, a lot of times it's sound related. If the sound is bad, and I can't. You ever have those moments where you feel like you're playing all by yourself? Sure, the sound is a, is a huge instigator yeah. of that. Yeah. Uh, probably the biggest, I would agree. Another is when the band is just not locking in. And it's like, well, you how can you lock in? You, you try to play something that everybody is going to rally around. And after a while, you realize, well, this isn't going to work. So, okay, I'm just going to play. You know, I'm going to show off a little bit. And... And, and indulge myself, like pull the Ferrari out of the, out of the garage and tear up a, a few race courses with it. You know, and I mean, really, that you get into that mode, and and yet it's it's all honest and it's all cool. The, the important another important thing is just not to be so damn judgmental, or have expectations. That's those are the two killers of music: is judgmental, and expectations. Really, I'm not saying don't try your best or don't demand of your... I, I think demanding is one of the best things in music. Demanding greatness, integrity, imagination from yourself and everybody around you is a wonderful thing. Judging is a bad thing. It leads only to bad decisions and negative effects. Expecting things to happen, again, where are you going to get out of that? The, the best thing that could happen is your expectations come true. Well, if you didn't have to have them, you'd still get the same thing. you know. But usually you don't get that. You get what you expected to happen doesn't happen. Now you're dealing with disappointment, with disorientation, all these things that didn't even need to be there in the first place if you were just 100% invested in making good music and not being judgmental but being demanding of yourself yeah. mm -hmm. and, and it's a very different things a lot of people would almost lump those two words in the same place they're different they're, things they're but they're different. closely related yes but they're the dynamic that makes one different is the thing that is enables progress enables productivity enables art the other one kills those things yeah and they're so close together because you can you can walk on stage with a swagger and Everybody needs to. The place to be humble is not on stage. Right? You can be humble after you finish and go, oh, no, that suck. But <laughs> you don't want to be like that on stage. you got to think you're really great on stage. Otherwise, you won't think anything that you play is worth milking. I always tell my students that. It's like you just played a different idea over every chord in this song. You didn't repeat one idea. Why? Because you didn't think it was good enough. When the truth is, is every idea you played was fine. You just didn't have the confidence to, to take it anywhere. So if you don't have any confidence, then you're just going to go from idea to idea and go, no, that sucked, and that sucked, and that sucked. And you're never going to, your solo is well, never going to tell a story. That's yeah. the judgmental part. It's judge, the judgmental part. So you're never going to tell a story because of your lack of confidence in your own ability to tell a story. So you have to be really, really very confident on stage and that's like i said that's very hard to be when your sound is disappointing you could be your own tone that's disappointing you so you're fighting to play good just because just to get a good tone that's the first thing in your mind is if i could only make this tone better i could play better and the tone doesn't get any better <laughs> the thing just spirals into hell <laughs> so. Or and it could be it like what I was talking about before, where you can't hear the bass and drums, and you feel like you're all alone out there, all by yourself, because you can't lock in with your guys, and you feel like they're not paying attention to what you play because they can't hear you either. Mm. So the whole thing becomes discombobulated and just falls apart. That's, That's a good one. Discombobulated. Discombobulated. Yeah, I think that has to do with women's breasts. But I'm not yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, that's what I was thinking about when I said it. <laughs> Discombobulated. When you're playing a gig in a tight room where everything's kind of you can hear each other really well and everything is popping and you can really bounce off each other and hear each other well, I find there's more of a looking at each other. You know, when you're looking into someone's eyes when you're playing, when I'm looking at Alan and he's looking at me and I play something and he goes, yeah, and he 
and he's there with me, not only does it make me think that he likes what I'm playing, but that he's there for me to try to make what I'm playing sounds even better, and he can do it, yeah. because he's a great drummer, and Travis is a great bass player, so they know when you play something good, at least as much as they've heard me play, they can tell when I'm on and when I'm not. And when I'm on, they know it, and they're, they're, they're on too. So those nights are awesome. Yeah. You live for those nights. Oh, yeah. But, well, th that leads me to another thing. You just brought up another thing that kind of makes me want to rant a little bit. Because <laughs> you heard my gig yeah, yeah, suck? Yeah, you keep on, <laughs> I want you to look at me when you're playing, not Alan. <laughs> I can't see you when you sit way the fuck back in the at the bar. Well, how else can I leave without you knowing? <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> yeah, I always think at the end of the set. I, I, just, I, you know, I just for the end of this shit. You no, know, I, I, well, I'm there at the beginning, then I go out the back and email, go on Facebook, do that shit. Right. Then I come back in for the last tune. Well, I know you're your last tune. I've always thought you were yeah. a smart guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We would undertake this little break just to remind you that you're special, we love you, we need you. And uh, you've been listening to Guitar Wank Podcast with Bruce Foreman, Scott Henderson, and I'm Troy McCoven, the guy who speaks a little funny. God, I don't even remember anymore. I'm not pissed off. But no, the looking, he, he, exactly what he said. Your eyes, your ears follow your eyes. Guitar players that look down, musicians that only look down at their hands when they're playing, drive me the up the wall. No, oh, I do that. I do oh, that well, I'll, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because, hey, you're, you just happen to be lucky you're not blind. <laughs> You're not Ray Charles, although it would be great to be Ray Charles. But He's dead, but... Yeah, it's too bad. The, well, that, he's decomposing. You know, he's not composing anymore. Um, but the thing is, is your ears follow your eyes. There's been numerous times on a gig where I'm trying to get somebody's attention. Where, I, hey, let's take it out. Let's take it to the bridge. Let's change this up. I'm going to do something really strange. Be ready. And the guy's got his hands on, he's looking down at his bass, he's looking down at his drums. It's like, I feel totally, I'm now not willing, or, uh, uh, you know, I'm holding back. I'm not sure that I can go ahead and make this bold thing happen because I don't feel like I've got anybody's attention. They may be kind of listening to me, although, let's be honest with ourselves, your ear and your attention follow your eyes. So, damn. I mean, I've been playing that guitar for 40, a lot of years, okay? 40, like, six years or something. 47 years I've been playing the guitar. Music even longer. I mean, in my years, not once has a C moved over to where C sharp is. <laughs> not on a piano, not on a guitar. I've played the drums before. I've never seen a snare drum on its own volition move from where I put it. Okay? So they, I know where they are. And I also know that if I'm looking down at my hands, I don't hear what's going on around me as well. I'm not even aware that I've got an audience listening to me. Now, I, work, I look around an awful lot when I play, as you guys have seen me. A lot of it is because I lead a band, and I'm kind of... Tra and, and the bands that I have are very agile. We change up stuff. A lot of things happen. So I need to be sort of like one of those guys on an aircraft carrier that brings in the planes, you know, with the flags and shit. But I still believe that all of us need to have a certain awareness of what's going on around us. And I do believe that this eyes fixated on the fingerboard has a tendency to insulate us from the experience of what's going on around us. So that's a bit of a rant, and, I, and it's a real rant with certain people I've played with where I've had to actually had to take them aside on the 
in guys who are older than me even, which is really hard, but I'm the leader of the band, and say, dude, you got to look up. I was trying to get your attention for two choruses, mm -hmm. and you had your head down. And you know, for what you're looking down at, it, it ain't really worth watching. <laughs> <laughs> According to what I'm hearing. To play devil's advocate, I've just got a question. Yeah. Now, I've seen really good guitar players who do look at their fingerboards. Yeah. I mean, really good ones, like I Kurt. Know. Kurt Rosenwinkel, he looks at his guitar when, when right. he plays. Yeah, I know. And But yet, he's, you can tell he's very acutely aware of what's going on around You can tell, sometimes, and I, I would, I don't know, sometimes I feel it's very Kurt-centric. I do feel that sometimes, mm -hmm. even with Kurt. But I, Kurt is, is, of course, an extremely high-level player and a bad example of that. Uh, you know, I mean, because at, at his level of playing... He obviously hears what's going on. Yeah, around but him, me but, too. I look at my fingers. But a lot. you know, but you look around a lot more than you think you do. Well, because I, I I hear you play, and I've seen you play. I'm not saying a I'm lot. stuck looking at my fingers because I do look around a lot. Yeah, but there are some things that I just don't feel that I'm able to pull off unless I look at my. Well, guitar. there's nothing wrong with that. That's like a that that thing you're pulling off took five seconds, two seconds. Oh yeah, I guess. I, see I mean, you're always here. looking around. You're. You're looking at your pedal board. You're looking at the guys. You're looking at. I know you're looking at the audience, and I know why. You're hoping, you're hoping a woman what will be there. What are you trying to insinuate? Well, you're hoping a woman will be there. And you're yeah, counting them. A woman singular would be great. For all the women out there listening, you some you guys are gonna all get together no, and turn right. up at Scott's. I, I think an all woman, an all woman audience at a Scott. That'd be amazing. And a Scott Henderson gig is about as likely as finding a hen with a dick on it. <laughs> I always tell this joke in my gigs when, you know, I see a, a, a bunch of men in the audience and I say, well, there's at least a few girls. That beats a Holsworth show where there's not, not only no girls in the audience, but no girls in the surrounding malls in the area. <laughs> <laughs> is Alan married? Is he Holdsworth married? I uh, yes, girlfriend I think. Oh, girlfriend. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. You know, no, no. I love Alan. Right? Yeah, yeah, he's yeah great. But you won't see too many women at his no, shows. No. But uh, <laughs> but you know what? I, I I will say something very prolific right now. Oh no, God! Say, yeah. You want a drum roll? All right. You, you, you want a drum roll? I'll move the beat a yeah, half yeah, beat over. All you yeah. students, listen to this. Yeah. But I have told my students so many times, don't concentrate on the neck of your guitar. Concentrate on the speaker of your amp because that's what people hear. They do not hear your fingerboard. Mm -hmm. They hear what's coming out of that speaker. Concentrate on what's coming out of your speaker. That's what people are listening to. What if it's and behind they don't, you? I'm not saying you have to look at it. I'm oh, saying okay. concentrate on the sounds that are coming out of your speaker because that's what your audience is right. hearing. Yeah. They are not hearing your fingers move up and down the fingerboard. And these guys that just are glued to the fingerboard, not because of they don't know where the notes are, but because of the whole concept of, let's see, I need to play a B over this G chord because that's the third, and that's what their mind is. Their, their, their mind isn't on, am I getting good tone? Am I playing something fun? Am I playing a good phrase? Am I playing a good sound that people might want to hear? Am I doing anything on, uh, on the guitar that people would want to listen to? Like... For example, B.B. King, who might not know that a G is the third of, of you know, these guys that oh, just play pretty oh, much play by ear. A G is the third of, oh, come man. on, finish Let's that. look that up. Let's hang on a second. You know what I mean? So they, they, may, not, they, they may not know. That's like great, I don't. He covered I have well. no idea what G is the third of. <laughs> is it E? <laughs> So anyway, um, uh, uh, yeah, I'm trying to put my 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 thoughts into the mind of a of a musician who is totally uneducated, who knows nothing about music, but just plays by ear. And I'm imagining that that covers a lot of blues players. So they're just playing. They don't really they don't really need to know what they're doing from a technical standpoint. They just need to make good sounds, get good tone play some good phrases. And I would add to it, be aware of who are you playing with? What's it blending with? Yeah. What are they playing? 
Where's the music going? Where do you want it to go? How does your part fit? Are you accompanying? Are you the solo voice? Are you know these are things that you need to be paying attention to. I mean, this that's the music here. You know that other stuff is practice, as we talked before. And I want to get back back to our drummer thing. And I hope this. I have one friend who who's, who explains his approach to soloing is he wants to make the drummer sound good. That's what he says in his solos, and and I and he's a very Miles Davis ish trumpet player. That's the I mean, so you can stylistically imagine who this guy is. He's a great educator, a brilliant player, very unique guy. But he's you know if you could say anything, he's in that particular. Here I go doing what the reviewers do and mention other names, but um, his thing is make the drummer sound good. Now that's predicated on having a musical drummer who's listening to you. That's you know predicated on a lot of things but if you get to that place where you're all playing together then you could see how by having the drummer sound good while you're playing is is the key to having a great solo and if the drummer sounds like shit you can be scott henderson and play g's all over e chords and still not sound good e minor chords ah he got it <laughs> ladies and gentlemen he's been sandbagging us all along he probably can sight read too he just doesn't want us to know <laughs> I have to say, when I go hear you play with Smitty, and Smitty's one of those guys who can play super busy. This is Smitty off the Jay Leno show. Yeah, yeah Marvin Smitty, Smitty Smith. Smith. Yeah. Yeah. He's one of those drummers, like Novak, who can play as busy as he wants, and you never have to wonder where the groove is. Yeah. I, it's there. It's, it's just totally amazing. Yeah. And when you hear Bruce play with him, and you hear how conversational the music is, and how... Bruce and Smitty are so aware of the same vocabulary that they have similar vocabulary in their rhythmic, you know, their rhythmic ideas. It's just a great matchup, you know, to, because they inspire each other and they play off each other. And it's a perfect example of how a, 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 an improviser should play with a drummer. It's perfect yeah. because it feels good, yet it's conversational and you never feel like anybody's just showing off. And Smitty's you always are, smiling. Yeah, he's a happy guy, man. He's well, he's happy because he's playing with Bruce. Who <laughs> wouldn't be? Oh, that's like that the sweetest the thing, thing on the podcast. That was the nicest thing I've ever said. Wow. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm getting around bracing myself for the, for the butt. <laughs> but. But, but on the other hand, how many concerts have I seen with drummers who play busy and it has nothing to do with what the soloist is playing? Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. Absolutely nothing. Dave Grohl. I don't know who I'm that joking. is, but I'll take that as a... <laughs> you don't know but who Dave Grohl is? I have... No, I don't know him. Foo Fighters drummer. Mm, no, I was joking. I'm not Dave familiar with the Foo Fighters, but... Yeah, but, um, but I have... <laughs> food do they, fighter. like the Food Fighters? Do they food fight fighters. with food or... Is they fight food. Food, food Fighters? Oh. Is that like a Chinese thing? Dave's going to be one of our guests on the show. You guys should know oh, this guy. Okay, well, I, I'll meet him. <laughs> but I, but <laughs> It's going to cost him. It's going to cost him. We're not going to share our thousand... Uh, Listeners a day with no just way, anybody. not with just anyone. No. Yeah, <laughs> Paul McCartney could be a good guest. I'd oh, like I, I would like Paul McCartney. I vote for Paul. That would be Paul, good. I'd like or Beyonce Ringo. would be awesome. Man. Beyonce, but Let's then she's going to bring all her black stuff with her. I want, I want, I want to have Donald Trump. <laughs> Trump, then he's going to bring all his Ted white Cruz. stuff with him. About Ted Cruz. Oh my Let's God, he's going to bring his, here. He's the next god. I just want to slit his throat. <laughs> so, um, uh. What was I saying? Oh, yeah. About the drummer thing. I have had the opportunity to play with a guy, and I'm not going to mention his name. Until next episode. But a guy, no, I won't mention his name, because he's a guy who really has the ability to do both. To totally confound me with how awful he plays, and then blow me away with how brilliant he is. And I mean in every way. Brilliant by being constructive, creative, imaginative, conversational, everything. Just really ears, just huge ears. The most subtle things you play, you pick up on and do something great to complement it. But at the same time, have the ability to totally blow all that musicality off and just be a complete moron. <laughs> and play way too much and stuff that has absolutely nothing to do with what's going on, play stump the band and play cousins of beats and throw everybody off and create train wrecks on stage. 
right? So I've seen this both sides of the fence from the same guy. So when I check drummers out, I sort of go, well, he's the bad side of this guy, and he's the good side of this guy. <laughs> This is real drum. This is the yeah, drum. Yeah, we podcast. need to get off that. We're fixing it. Right, we're done with it. Now, this is a good segue. Guys, tell the listeners out there that you want to hear some questions from them. Or do you? We you want to hear go. some questions from you guys. There you we go. want to hear some questions from you guys. Sure, we do. Post yeah. it on where? The Facebook site, right? Yeah, push it, post it on Facebook. Scott, who do you want to add to guitar Wikipedia this week? I Wankipedia. Would, Wankipedia. Yeah. What did I call it? Wikipedia. Wikip- oh, I'm going to hell. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to mention Steve Cardness, who's a New York guitarist. And uh, for a time, he was out here in L.A. Actually, he's played uh, with Larry Kuntz. He played with Paul Motion's band, mm-hmm. um, with Kurt Rosenwinkel. And uh, he's just an excellent jazz guitar player very modern lines very modern and also really melodic too um great tone one of the guys that plays a 335 but doesn't sound like everybody else that plays a 335 he's really got his own tone on that guitar yep yeah and uh just love the way he plays and i've had the opportunity to play with him a couple times uh here in la well dig this i knew steve when he was like I think 15 or 16, he came to a Jamie Abersold camp that I was teaching at. Uh-huh. And he was, you know, he was so great then. He was really into Pat Metheny at that time. But he was so great. And then I ended up getting called to do this gig on the road with Bobby Hutcherson, and I just quit the gig in the middle of the week. And I let Steve take over. And like he was teaching at a Abersol clinic in his teenage years, and he was ready to do it. I mean, I said, Steve, you're going to have to take over for me because I just got called this gig. And that's why Jamie Ebersol will never hire me anymore. <laughs> but everybody else on the staff was like, if you don't take this gig, I'm going to take it. So right. get out of here. But anyways, uh, Steve, I, I, Steve was great then, and he's really developed into just an amazing, unique voice. And check him out to find out why he's so in demand. That's awesome. I want to check these guys out. There's so many amazing players that don't get any recognition well, Why we have Wankipedia. That's right. Why well, we have Wankipedia. So this is really, really cool. So uh, it would be awesome. All right. Until next week. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right, guys. That was another great show. Appreciate it. And until next week's show, Scott, say goodbye to our lovely viewers. Peace. Sir Bruce. Keep picking that thing, it'll never heal. (laughs) Until next week's show.